Thank you for your patience while well, I got a few things ironed out, but I'm glad that we are all online here. Um, my name is Deborah Meyerson. Um, I'd like to welcome Anna Killian Hansen to come up and introduce things, and then we'll get rolling. Hi, many of you know, but I am Anna Killian Hansen. I'm the Director of Housing and Neighborhood Development. Today, this is a public outreach um, meeting uh, in order to gain some valuable input on our consolidated plan, which is a five-year spending plan for HUD, our impediments um, to fair housing, and then also we're, any feedback that we're receiving, we're also going to incorporate in our housing plan. So we do appreciate you guys being here, spending your lunch hour with us, um, and we value your input. Um, Deborah Meyerson is our consultant for this um, plan for the public outreach. And then online we have MNL Consulting um, based out of Philadelphia assisting our plan as well. De Deborah, this is Bill. <clears throat> it's a little uh, hard to hear you all in that uh, in speaking. I don't know if others on the on the phone or on the um, virtual link is it's the same, but it was a little hard to hear you guys. <clears throat> Okay, just I'm just conveying from the tech team, from the CATS team, that they understand it's a problem, it's something they haven't been able to resolve, and so hopefully we can make use of the resources we've got. Um, and again, I, that may be true for others who are uh, other participants online as well, because this is a hybrid meeting with participants from the public who will be both online as well as in person so unfortunately i can't yeah, understand yeah. the word you're saying we, we're yeah we back, the more you can speak yeah. into the microphone okay the yeah yeah you can't move away from the microphone when you're right on the microphone we can hear you but when you're not it's 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 very difficult okay well i will make an effort to do that and i will also note we have a public microphone there because again we're i'll give an intro but we're here to get public comment and so when you do speak i will ask you to use that microphone please and hopefully learn like i'm learning of speaking into it so the folks online can hear. Did that do okay, folks? Um, Bill and Samantha? Okay. I mean, it's a little bit better, but again, if you could just try to talk slow, it'd be great. Okay, I'll talk slowly and right into the mic, thanks. Okay, well, let's get rolling. Again, I'm Deborah Meyerson with Meyerson Consulting. I'm doing the public outreach uh, part of this meeting uh, with the prime consultant, m and Associates, and glad to have you all here today. This is the second of three public meetings that we're doing as part of this, in addition to six stakeholder workshops. Uh, and so we're glad to have you here today. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. So, Every five years, the city must complete a consolidated plan, and it sets priorities for the use of community development block grant funds, also known as CDBG, and home investment partnership funds, also called HOME. Uh, and the city's preparing its new plan for fiscal year 2025, 2029. This effort is also to produce an analysis of impediments to fair housing choice, often called AI for short, um, and we'll talk about that too. Um, but in addition, every year the city prepares an action plan that helps implement uh, each annual portion of this five-year cycle. And so this public outreach is also for implementing the first year in that five-year cycle as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit about what each of these um, documents is. The analysis of impediments to fair housing choice identifies barriers that restrict housing choice for members of protected classes and makes recommendations to resolve those barriers. The consolidated plan describes community development priorities and goals over the next five years based on an assessment of affordable housing and community development needs, as well as market conditions and available resources. And finally, the annual action plan describes how the city will use federal funds, which again is both the consolidated plan and the AI, um, to address identified needs in 2025. Next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit more of a deep dive into the community development block grant, just to get the basics down on that. So, um, CDBG is administered by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, which we will call HUD, uh, and cities, states, and some counties are eligible to receive CDBG funds annually from HUD. 
and the overarching goals of CDBG to provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing, to provide a suitable living environment, and to expand economic opportunities. And then just some of the activities that would fit this. Um, it must provide benefit to low and moderate income uh, people. It prevents or eliminates slum and blight and meets an urgent need that threatens the health and welfare of residents. And then of course there's the what's eligible, what's not eligible, who is eligible. So who is eligible? Private nonprofits that are corporations, associations, agencies with nonprofit status are all eligible for CDBG funds as well as city departments. And then um, some eligible activities include housing rehabilitation, public facilities and improvement, public services, demolition, acquisition, and program administration. So things, examples of what are not eligible, uh, fundraising, political activities, expenses required to carry out responsibilities or functions of local governments, income payments, building or a portion thereof used for general conduct of government, and then the purchase of equipment, fixtures, motors, motor vehicles, furnishings, or other personal property. And that's just a sampling. It's not exhaustive. It's just to give you an idea of how those funds can be spent. So to qualify for an eligible activity, um, again, must serve lower moderate income households or individuals, and that's at least 70% of the funds, and then addressing slum and blight, no more than 30%. And then how is lower moderate income uh, qualified? There's three ways to do that. That can be a service area, an area benefit for the public improvement or facility, income intake of programs that primarily serve low and moderate income households are eligible for funding, and that definition of moderate income is no more than 80% of the area median income adjusted for household size. And then finally, the presumed benefit. Some groups are presumed to be low and moderate income and may not require one of the other two methods, and that includes uh, abused children, battered spouses, elderly persons, disabled persons, people experiencing homelessness, illiterate adults, migrant farm workers, and people living with AIDS. So now we'll do the same uh, overview on home investment partnership program basics because we hope that will help you with your comments and questions today. So the home investment partnership program is funding to help provide safe and decent housing for low and moderate income households. Eligible activities include rental housing, owner occupied housing, home buyer assistance, rehabilitation, new construction, and tenant based rental assistance. So a minimum of 15% of each year's home allocation must be used for a community housing development organization's project. So that's an organization also called a CHODO that has a specific project that's being funded. And how an organization becomes certified as a CHODO is that they must be a community-based nonprofit organization. They're focused on increasing the supply of affordable housing and then they must have a board of directors that is composed with community residents. And our third part of this triad is the analysis of impediments to fair housing. So this is also something that uh, is recommended for update every five years. Again, it works to do it in coordination with the consolidated plan. It identifies barriers that restrict housing choice for members of protected classes. And the next slide we'll talk about exactly what those classes are but it uses demographic and housing data to determine impediments that are limiting fair housing choice, so access to housing, which is distinct from affordability but often overlaps. Um, and it also uses input from stakeholder participation, such as today, to identify potential impediments for fair housing. And so the development of a fair housing action plan proposes specific actions to address these identified impediments to uh, overcome them to make more fair housing choice available. So um, the Fair F Housing Act, there's a federal Fair Housing Act, there's also state and even some local elements that apply, but uh, at its most, again, this is the federal funding, so we're talking about the seven protected classes, um, and it protects people from discrimination when they are renting or buying a home, um, getting a mortgage, 
seeking housing assistance or engaging in other housing related activities. And so these seven protected classes include race, color, national origin, religion, sex, which includes gender identity and sexual orientation, familial status, and disability. So again, we welcome your feedback on uh, impediments to fair housing as well. So a quick look at the schedule for this entire project. Again, how do we get to the five-year new plan? So right now we're doing the public meetings. Again, this started yesterday. This is the second of three and then the additional um, stakeholder workshops. And we will be wrapping that up uh, September 3rd. Um, in addition, there is a, a survey that's online that's open till September 10th. Um, I know that for online, Angela will be posting the link in the chat. We'll also have the link uh, at the end of these slides. But encourage you, if there's anything that you miss getting chance, if you think about later and want to add, um, feel free to use the survey for that. Or if there's people that you think would like to provide their opinions but couldn't make it to a public meeting, uh, we hope that survey will be available to them as well and encourage them to use that. Um, so uh, November 15th, we'll have a draft of the consolidated plan and analysis of impediments available uh, internally for review. Uh, we'll have the annual action plan completed uh, in March. And then there'll be a public comment period. So much like we're having a public comment period now, uh, this will be a little narrower because the draft plan will be done, but we want to uh, share it for public comment. And so April of 2025 will be a public hearing to invite public comment on the draft AI. And then finally, once that is all wrapped up in May, there will be uh, council, city council will uh, have that before them for approval uh, in a resolution. And so then it goes to HUD and it will be ready for the program year starting July 1st, 2025. Okay, so now we're gonna start turning this over to you. I have some suggested questions just to help you thinking about it, but um, again, you've heard a little bit about the range of things that we're seeking with this public input process, and so I uh, welcome you to use this as a starting point but not an ending point. So the sample questions we have include, what barriers do you or others in your community face when trying to access affordable housing? How do current city policies and programs impact your ability or others in your community to find safe and affordable housing? In your experience, are there neighborhoods or areas in the city where affordable housing is more difficult to find? And if so, what factors contribute to this? What types of, afford of housing assistance or programs could help ensure fair access to affordable housing? And finally, are there any specific groups in the community who face greater challenges finding affordable housing or experiencing more housing discrimination? And then what can the city do to address those challenges? And I'll just note, just to make sure, that this applies to both rental and for sale housing. There's a variety of challenges that can arise and we are interested in your insights about any of the above. So I will stop there. Um, and invite your comments or questions. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I just unloaded here, and if you've heard it before, great. If you haven't, you may have questions. Uh, I will ask you to use the mic over there because Katz is recording this as well as we're recording it for the city, and we wanna make sure that all the comments get recorded. So I will pause there. I'll also invite Bill and the MNL team. You often have excellent insights and, and things to add to my start, so I, I might start with you just of anything you wanna add before we have folks come up. No, uh, that was a really good overview. Uh, all I would say is that, um, again, we're just uh, using the, these sessions uh, to get input on affordable housing, uh, community development issues, any changing or emerging trends that you've seen in the city from a community development or a ho affordable housing perspective over the last five years, any emerging trends that you're seeing uh, in your community uh, that may be worth uh, talking about or discussing. Uh, again, uh, just really want to uh, get insights and input uh, so that we're, um, incorporating your insights and comments into the planning process as we move forward here with the consolidated plan, the, fi uh, the five-year plan, the annual plan, and the analysis of impediments to fair housing, so. Great, thank you. Um, so now it's the public opportunity. Um, I hope that you have some, again, either comments or questions that you can share with us today. Yes, and if you don't mind using the mic, I would appreciate it, thank you.
Well, it's not an emerging problem. I've lived in a neighborhood for 10 years, and it's been a status quo for 10 years. Um, the uh, problem of investors buying property and then letting it sit empty, vacant, perfectly good houses for 10 years now, and uh, some of them mow the lawn, some of them don't. Uh, we have a couple of properties that uh, are falling into ruin. They are, the owners are practicing demolition through neglect, which I think is against the law. It's still going on 10 years. I've turned it into hand a whole bunch of times. And uh, with the uh, new UDO that we got and uh, the uh, opening of uh, properties to triplex, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, and everything, the situation has gotten worse. Investors bought more houses, and they are sitting empty. This is a big problem in the near west side. I can't believe it's not a problem around the city, and I don't understand, if we have a housing crisis, why this continues. Thank you. Thanks for having this. I'm sorry I missed the beginning part of your um, presentation. Um, I live over in Barclay Gardens, over near the Zen Center, and um, also a member of BCOS. And so some of the questions I have are for myself, which, you know, um, I'll start with that one. And that is, I gotten onto my neighborhood association for a project that I'm working on for BCOS in regards to urban agriculture. And um, that, uh, I have no idea who who is in charge of that. So if this, I don't know how to find that out. Um, so that's one. So if there's neighborhood associations that exist, then how do we know who's in charge and how to get a hold of them? Because I've lived in my uh, house for you know, like 14 years and didn't even think there was one that existed. So that may be something that others um, may want to find out and could help with some of these other neighborhood uh, grants, such as what BCOS does have, uh, BCOS being uh, Bloomington Commission on Sustainability, because um, those are not being utilized. Um, the second is, uh, I've got a lot of things that, some of it has to do with the rentals, um, some of it's more kind of might be falling under environmental, and that is um, speaking with someone from MC Iris, um, Ellen Jackard, she said that there have been um, a lack of getting rid of invasives. There were a lot of progress being made, but now there's not that happening because the rental companies aren't as concerned as homeowners in regards to getting rid of invasives and ke keeping them out. Um, I'm concerned with some of these, well, one of the reasons I came was I started to fill this out and then found out that there was a meeting taking place today. And um, I, I was under the impression whenever I started it, I stopped because some of the questions, it does not uh, have an option for not applicable because I didn't see the way these were, um, the questions were written was for a homeowner as compared to someone who is a renter. Um, and then another with what I'm doing with uh, for B costs is looking at homeowners and neighborhood associations to see how many uh, homes are owned in these neighborhoods versus rentals, and then how um, uh, how much um, kind of urban agriculture or edible landscaping is there. And so I'm interested to see how some of this has changed in gathering that data in one place for the city. I'm just curious, I really appreciate your bringing the Bloomington Commission on Sustainability into the discussion and sharing your experience. Do you have a sense of what the priorities are for BCOS that might align with the goals of the consolidated plan? Sure, I mean, for everyone here. My name is Jamie Scholl, and um, my background is in urban agriculture, and I'm a grower, and um, 
I'm pretty new on to the commission. I gave a presentation this past uh, week in our meeting, and um, I'm uh, like we're we're kind of reorganizing. We've had a large turnover, and there are still two vacancies. Um, I think there's two that needs to be fill, filled. So we're looking at seeing uh, something for that's. Uh, I know one member is interested in like the composting um, part uh, that's kind of in process. We're looking at something for bees um, to have some guidelines for those who keep and want to keep bees, uh, as well as for my end, uh, the urban agriculture to know, you know if we're food secure, because I feel like we're less food secure. We have more um, homeowners associations that have uh, restrictions on even something as beautiful as an SBLEA that could be incorporated into the language of an HOA document or a neighborhood association. So I'm at the very beginning of looking at that. And with the many new members coming on, we're still working out how we want to proceed. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Well, certainly, and again, I'm my fa I'm facing the folks who are here in person, but I definitely want to remember that we do have folks here online. Um, is there someone who did have their hand raised who would like to take a turn at comment right now? Okay. Well, again, raising yeah. your hand. At, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, uh, uh, someone zero rose uh, raised their hand, saying also commission on sustainability. <clears throat> oh, okay. So we have other representation from BCAS here. Thank you. Um, so I will try and alternate between in-person and online, um, but it looks like we have somebody in person now. Hi, my name is Eric Petrie, and I will try to be as concise as I can be. Unfortunately for me, affordable housing is a very of strong interest as it is the subject of my capstone project for my master's. Um, and I chose to target Bloomington specifically with the blessings of my academic advisor, and I have been totally disenchanted. <laughs> Affordable housing in Bloomington, and I, I'm just, I would like to call out the white elephant in the room, which is we are surrounded by incredible development on every side. You can't separate the rental market from the housing market because the rental market in Bloomington is driving up the cost of everything. The sad thing about Bloomington is we are the most expensive market in the state of Indiana. More than 35% of our residents are housing burdened, meaning they pay more than 30% of their income towards housing. More than 20% of our residents are severely cost burdened. More than one in five people in Bloomington pay more than 50% of their income towards housing. This isn't a cri I mean, this is a gastronomical crisis. And most recently, in a conversation with someone, it was called out that maybe the market forces will correct the situation, which is absurd. The market in Bloomington does not follow the supply and demand. We have got a surplus of supply and our prices keep continuing to escalate. So my direct question in particular is, what vehicle can we use to provide the data? Because I have not been able to find out occupancy rates for all of the gigantic luxury apartment complexes that we have in our city. I know that a certain percentage are supposed to be dedicated towards affordable housing, but they can skirt that by paying into an affordable housing fund. So it would be really interesting to me if the city could produce the data that shows our occupancy rates. And very much like the other gentleman said, investors coming in to buy things up, that is, that is an issue. And so many of these large apartment complexes, I live in a, so many of these large apartment complexes right now are simply for the sake of investing. Occupancy is secondary. Um, 
shouldn't there be a vehicle in place that requires these developers to report their occupancy rates? And if they are unoccupied for a period of time, shouldn't they be repurposed? <coughs> How does this whole vehicle work? I'm so sorry. I, I don't have all the answers. I have as many questions as I do answers. Um, but it seems like to me that is a very key component that's missing. If we don't find out our occupancy rates versus our rent, I don't know how we're going to, no one wants to hear about regulations and control, cost controls, but our costs are, are out of control. I now live in a five bedroom, 2,500 square foot home all by myself. My kids are grown. I cannot afford to buy a house in Bloomington. I, it, it, is, it is incredibly insane. Um, and I, I don't really have a choice. Um, and I, I, I'm very tempted at the end of my capstone project to say that Bloomington's affordable housing program is leave. <laughs> Move to Bedford. Move to Spencer. Move out. Because our costs are gastronomically out of control. And um, so I hope that's helpful. And did your research for your master's um, paper, did that, um, in, did you look at what you felt from based on your findings, what solutions might be viable? I'm just interested because I appreciate this, that you've done this research. This is still a, a work in progress for me. And I am working, I'm diligently working on trying to finish my capstone project. Um, but you know, I, I became so disenchanted with the entire experience. I, I came in with, I mean, I'll be honest, I was naive. I was like, I'm gonna provide solutions for Bloomington's affordable housing, and I just became disenchanted. Okay. Um, and again, part of the problem is, is some of the statistical data that I would like to have is not available, or at least, it's seen from the, at least I hit those roadblocks. Perhaps it is available and I'm just ignorant, um, but that, that's been a huge part of the policy. But when I overheard a former councilman say that our city council believes that market forces will control the housing, I, I was, I was mind boggled. I, the market forces of supply and demand will not work in this situation. We have an incredible surplus of supply, incredible demand, and the prices just keep escalating. So. Again, can that's I, counterintuitive can, in economic terms. Right. Can, I, can I ask a can I ask a question? Could you um could you follow up or provide a little bit more context or detail regarding the comment on surplus surplus of supply, uh, and and what that's based on? Just curious as to who, uh, where that's coming from. Okay, um, this again is based on more of my intuition than it is statistical data because the statistical st the stats aren't available. Um, there is not one side of this town that is not being developed into some sort of luxury apartment complex, right? And the demographics don't say, the most recent census don't show our population growth has grown exponentially, but our housing is growing exponentially. So how does that, that's, that's to me, that's common sense. I'm like, how, who's renting all of these apartments if our population is not expanding at an exponential rate? I don't, I don't understand how that could possibly be true. But again, if the developers are not required to report occupancy rates, how do we, how do we know? And Correct. Uh, one of the comments that we heard yesterday is that there is a lot of uh, developers creating um, student housing, and that may be some of it because there's very little uh, student housing on the campus of IU. And so have you taken that into consideration? Are you spe speaking specifically non-student housing um, uh, in your uh, analysis? I have not been able to get to that point either, and simply that that does that was a comment that came up in part of my discussions with various peoples in our community, that IU has stopped developing student housing, and we're it's basically a, a public-private partnership at this point where they're pushing students off campus into these apartment complexes, but again, our pop student population hasn't grown exponentially; it's grown. But has it grown enough to justify the development that we're creating? And it seems like there could be a vehicle there. And I understand that these are, affordable housing is a multivariate issue. It is so complicated. There is never one, it's not just gentrification. 
it's not just developers buying a few houses in a in a developed neighborhood. Um, it's not just and I can tell you that from my experience, it is so complicated that that's why I said I will try to be concise, because if I'm not careful, all the squirrels in my attic will come through the microphone and I'll be rattling off statistics and be going oh 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 and I'll sound like I've lost my marbles, but. It is, it's a really super complicated issue, but it's also an issue that I think the city is gonna to have to take a more deliberate regulatory stance in order to try to arrest. If we're going to let the market satisfy the problem, I think it's gonna take a deliberate hand of controlling the market forces to some degree. What kind of regulatory measures are you thinking of when you say that? I think the best example of some things that are working in Bloomington, the Summit Hill Community uh, Development Corporation building the, uh, working with the land trust, land trust issues can work. Um, there's a gentleman in this room today that was involved in the Bloomington uh, land trust years ago that could not, could not remain viable. The market forces pushed them out. They just simply could not sustain themselves as I understand it, and Patrick could elaborate on this, as I understand it, if the city owns the land and the homeowner owns the home, that at least gives people that are on the lower income scale the ability to develop equity. Um, but see, that's a control. If the city continues, as these properties become available, there are market forces, there are ways that we can be more involved. And I also see I mean, it could be a bond issue. It could be, there, there are many different vehicles that could get there. This would take a lot of, uh, a whole committee in of itself could spend an infinite amount of time trying to develop things. Um, but the first time home buyers, my first home was on near West Side, 916 West 6th Street. I paid $73,000 for that home, and I sold it within four years after making some small improvements. Um, that home that I paid $73,000 for is probably going for about $250 now. How do we, how do we arrest this? It's, but for first home time buyers, um, that is the biggest issue for me personally, because I had two small children at the time. If I had two small children on my carpenter's wages today, I could not buy a home in this town. And I think that is really the thing that drives my passion so much, because I think young families should be able to live in our town. And we are, we are not providing the forum for them. It's, it's not available. Thank so, you. Mm -hmm. I will just mention at least one source I know in terms of occupancy rates is that the Monroe County Apartment Association has an annual presentation usually in January that looks at um, market demand and anticipated and usually reports on occupancy levels there. I believe the hand department also has some figures on that that I don't know if Anna you've heard a lot uh, in terms of this if there's any comments you want to share from that but if you do it do it at the mic. I'm sorry will you say again? Oh my god I'm so sorry. Would you say again? Oh, I'm just inviting the director of the hand department to add okay. any uh, in terms of occupancy so levels much. or uh, other things based on your comments. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I really appreciate the feedback on, on that particular subject. Um, I don't have current data as of this month, but the most recent data that we've received is that the occupancy rate of the apartments are about 90% with the exception being newly constructed buildings that come online in the middle of a lease cycle. So it typically takes a few months for them to get leased up. Um, I know that there's a couple of buildings with some vacancies, but those are typically buildings that come online in the middle of an average lease cycle. So 90% is pretty high, however. Um, I do also have some additional studies I'd be more than happy to share with you that, that go over some of the statistics of both owner and rental units that might help you as well. So please um, make sure I know your exact name so I can email you um, some information. Thank you, appreciate that additional information. You wanna come on up? Good afternoon, this is Christopher M.G., Sunny Slope resident and uh, with the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. A couple things. 
with regard to the, the CBG block grants, we're not talking about a lot of money, so where can we go probably the farthest? And I think we've seen some success with ARPA funds in the county um, for home repairs. Let's keep those who can afford, that are living here, can afford to live here. The price of land is the price of land. Building's expensive, but where we, where we can move the, uh, the meter a little bit is on the margins here, and that's keeping people in their homes. Um, a little bit of this goes into planning departments, and all of these things are kind of interchangeable, but the, the recently passed um, Summit District PUD with mixed housing and different options, that's the direction we need to go with density, especially as, especially as the city cannot expand its, its current boundaries. Um, the ROI Regional Opportunity Study, I think, had like 4,200 units needed um, in the next 10 years for housing. So there is the need to keep building, and maybe we don't like the monolith um, apartment complexes that keep coming up. But there is a theory, and this is where we kind of are looking at, that maybe people on the rentals that are in your neighborhood are kind of moved into one of these larger, as they're deemed, luxury apartments. So this is kind of, we have to be reasonable of what the city can do and what the city cannot do with terms of housing. And the, you know, the auxiliary housing, that's something I know it's very sensitive, but I, we need to start looking at that as, as an option and looking at regulations and maybe looking at some landscape and regulations with, the, with uh, regards to um, affordable housing and things that make it a little bit more affordable. What are the incentives that we can do for development on that end? But we got to realize what we can do and what we can't do. And some of these things are, are, are a little bit pie in the sky, I think. But uh, there are some actions that I think the city specifically hand can take, and I think it's using the, the, the money that we do have and some of the regulations that the state allow us to do to maximize that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know the city does have a repair program. I think there's opportunity certainly to expand that as well as I've heard in comments even in the last couple of days just looking at ways to make it more nimble and flexible because federal funds often have some constraints or additional time that's needed. So. Oh, thanks. I was going to go to that next. And, and just, just as a reminder, the feedback for this is also going to be utilized for local funding as well in our housing options. So it's not just the CBG on top of it. Yeah, so there's ways to use this feedback in a variety of levels. Thank you. So we have someone online who'd like to uh, take a turn, please. Okay, so for the person who's online who'd like to speak so far, I don't know if you're muted or, but just so you know, we cannot hear Hello. you. Okay, your voice is here. Thank you. Yep. Zero Rose uh, recently joined the Commission on Sustainability, also a non new, newer local nonprofit, Blue Bee Holistic Affordable Housing. And we're dealing with some casework with some clients um sometimes policy of uh city entities actually impact and create a situation where a landlord evicts which makes someone essentially unrentable and so we have to involve legal services um one of the issues is uh the the last census you know there's some qualms to be had with the last census not being quite accurate from 2020 but that uh, 43, uh, 43,000 students out of a population of 80,000 puts them at a little over half. And I learned at the recent Residence Academy uh, meeting that um, whereas most communities are 30 to 40% rentals, Bloomington is 67% rentals. And so that's part of how some of those numbers kind of shake out. Um, uh, with the commission, I do believe, you know, data is part of our, our mission statement that we are to compile and advise city bodies and create data sets. And so as a newer member, I'm going to be pushing to be looking into that and we're forming some new working groups. They apparently haven't had uh, working groups for a couple of years. Uh, but we're working on forming those to start, you know, devoting in these various areas. 
I think one solution uh, would be the city acquiring land, whether for land trusts or to um, give preference or uh, incentives to nonprofit housing development rather than typical developers so that a different model that it's not about market rate um, that's actually there to make it affordable and not about making exorbitant profit. Another component that's always left out is environmental design. It's seen as a luxury uh, thing and it's actually a way to build in resilience and to cut costs of living. So if there's renewable energy generation on site, that's cutting you utility costs. If there's urban agriculture, food security systems on site, that's lowering food costs. And those can be green jobs, entry level green collar jobs, so that resources are not just drained into certain low income developments, but the residents can actually be employed, earn their own keep, and you know so that it's seen as more than just a unit of extraction um and with holistic affordable housing our uh, models uh, center in eco ethic as a way to address ecological challenges and economic crises at the same time uh, we now have a member of the County Environmental Commission and a member of the City Council interested in our plan for a tiny home agri-hood. There are uh, such things in Detroit and there are zoning models, templates that could be transferred. Um, what we'll probably start with is a designated uh, tent land for the homeless but moving it toward tiny home eco village with a long, you know, as transitional housing, as other programs ramp up and other units become available. I think there's always going to be a need for something intermediate. And at present, I believe the mayor's plan is uh, no funding for anything between shelters or apartments or housing. Uh, uh, but there's, there's still a need uh, in the middle there. And uh, so, Holistic affordable housing would certainly be interested in hearing from anybody that's uh, commenting today, find our group on Facebook. And again, as a newer member of the Commission on Sustainability, you should look us up because part of the mission of the Commission on Sustainability are issues of equity and things like housing. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. Patrick, would you like to come up? Thank you, Deb. Um, as it was mentioned before, uh, I did have some involvement with some of these issues in a prior life before I retired. Um, I got a long list of questions, which I will not, not ask all of these. Um, you're right. It's complicated. There is no single magic bullet. It's going to have to be many, 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 many different solutions. The nonprofit sector with their low income housing tax credits, were, which are extremely difficult to acquire, sometimes it takes a couple of years, maybe even more, before a project is even eligible. And, you know, developers don't like to wait that long to do a project. So that's a federal issue which we have no control of. Uh, the state of Indiana is very restrictive in terms of what communities can do in terms of regulating housing. Uh, um, and so that's a big issue, but it's one that we can have some influence on, I believe. So we need to have uh, a goal of working with our state legislators to help us address these issues. The other thing that we need to do is we need to educate our local government officials so that they understand what the impact of their actions are on this particular issue. Because sometimes I think they're operating 
in an ideal world where they still see Bloomington as this garden oasis in the middle of southern Indiana. And we're a very urban community, and we have to embrace density. Uh, it's, it's not something that people who live in nice, spacious neighborhoods uh, want to hear, but it's an issue that uh, we have to face. Uh, there are other, uh, Alan, uh, I live in Prospect Hill, so I'm very aware of the kind of issues that, that you're dealing with. And Eric, we bought a house for $75,000 32 years ago. And I hate to tell you what my taxes are this year. You know, I'm paying $100 a week in property taxes. That's not affordable for anybody, you know, we're managing on a retiree's income, but it's very, very difficult. So there are these compendium of issues that each one of it, each one of them might have some solutions. When you look at them globally, it just seems so overwhelming. The university, when I retired there, had 200 individual housing units, like houses that were scattered around the neighborhood on the periphery of the campus, which they acquire to, uh, secure land for expansion. And they would rent these out to generally people who work at the university, so they provide some little housing there. But how much do we work with the university in terms of how to uh, help the situation in Bloomington? The uni there, are, there are communities who've worked with large employers, and the university is one of the largest we have, to help their employees purchase property. You know, I live in a neighborhood that a lot of people don't understand, but the Showers Corporation had their own kind of credit union or bank, and they helped their employees buy houses. A lot of those Gable L's that march up Third Street uh, or in some of the other neighborhoods like yours, they were built by employees uh, of showers with the help of showers to do that. Um, it's not a, it's not a, a new concept. Uh, if, you know, so those are some of the ideas that, that just come to mind. Uh, and where I came from originally, central Indiana, Tornado Alley, uh, mobile homes, as, as risky as they are in some particular cases, uh, were affordable housing. And you know, and if you go to some communities in rural Indiana, that is the only option available. Uh, and this community seems to have a dislike for, for that particular solution. Uh, it's, not, it's not the best way to, to provide housing. A mobile home is kind of like an automobile. It loses its value over time, rather than a piece of real estate which increases in value over time. Uh, those are issues that, that need to be involved. One of the things that is currently disturbing in my neighborhood is the proliferation of Airbnbs. I heard a statistics about a month or two ago that there are up to 400 Airbnbs in this community. That's the size of my community. There are about 400 households in Prospect Hill. The state of Indiana probably has, has not allowed communities to regulate them to an extent. Um, so, and those are houses that sit empty, except for, you know, sports weekends uh, and, and times like that. Um, we've talked about investor owners over and over and over again, and I don't know what the solution or what the answer to that is. Uh, it, I remember when I first bloomed moved to Bloomington, our, our investor owners that built student housing were local people that we knew in the community. And uh, they had some pride of place and they understood some of the issues. Uh, when the real estate investment trust started buying property and uh, raising the costs, uh, it became out of our hands. It's probably not controllable except through the IRS. Uh, anyway, uh, those are some of the issues that, 
that I've come across over the period of time that I've worked in this issue. Um, Eric mentioned the land trust. I was on the board of Monroe Housing, so Housing Solutions at one point in time. And they got to the point where they couldn't buy any more house or property because it was too expensive. And the middle to lower income homeowners didn't have the wherewithal to pay their lot rent on a timely basis. And the, and the land trust operated on income from the rent that they got on the piece of property that somebody's house was built on. And you know, for a, for a low income housing uh, operation or organization to keep suing its resident tenants for land rent didn't make sense. And that was one of the, one of the contributing factors to its demise. Um, I could go on, and well, I, I will fill out your, 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 your survey online with some of my ideas and so, uh, but. You've touched on a lot of great topics. I wanted to ask just one in terms of just what caught my ear, which is when you envision a need for higher density, what does that look like from your point of view? You talked about 80. Oh, we, we talked about ADUs. Uh, there, so there are some lots in some of our neighborhoods, and it, there's there are a couple of additions in Prospect Hill with these long, skinny lots, and uh, they could be subdivided. So if the regulations were changed, such as the ADU now has to be built by the person who owns and lives there, so. And building an ADU is not inexpensive. And so it's probably with, not within the means of a lot of people who live in my neighborhood who have these ginormous lots to build one to, to help somebody out. But if there was a, a, a way on the books that we could begin to sell off and subdivide those lots so that somebody could purchase that and build a home, not a, not a huge home, but a house, and you know, I grew, again, I grew up in a, in a factory town where people raised families in 900 to 1,000 square feet. You know, we don't have to build these giant houses. Uh, it's not what people have come to expect, but it func it's functional. So I think we need to really take a hard look at our, our comprehensive plan uh, all of a sudden I've forgotten the name of it, but there are things we can do locally on a local level with our ordinances to really address the issue and not try to be like San Jose in you know, Southern California, but let's address what our Southern Indiana issues are and what our Southern Indiana solutions are. One final note is when I first started working in this field in central Indiana, I remember going to a meeting with Tommy Allison. And this was a meeting to, to work on the census. And college towns have a particular problem with data, the way the census looks at communities and the way they use data because the census is taken uh, in the spring when students are on campus, and that is their resident at the time. And so a lot of those 43,000 people in the census, you know, they're not permanent residents, they're transients. Uh, but they're, in terms of the federal government, they don't see that as difference. Um, so it was an issue 30, 40 years ago. I don't know when Tommy was here, but it was a while back. Uh, and it continues to be an issue now. So are there, there are other communities in the country, small towns with large universities, you know, Penn, 
you know, Happy Valley, what's the name of the, uh, where Penn State is. It's a small community in the middle of nowhere with a giant university. Is there an organization of those kinds of cities that work with these kinds of issues on a national basis, model programs that have been created that we could use? Granted, each state has several separate it's an interesting funding idea. mechanisms and separate regulations, but to me it's an idea. Somebody out there is dealing with the same issue that we are, and we need to talk with them, we need to work with them, and... Yeah, yeah. Um, our firm uh, actually did a, um, just recently last year, did a affordable housing needs assessment in Center County, Pennsylvania, where a state college is located. Um, one of the interesting things that they have there is a, um, an affordable housing overlay uh, in the borough where the college, where the university is, uh, which requires affordable housing if student housing is to be developed or other, uh, uh, you know, student related housing is being built. It requires the developer to create additional affordable units either in the complex where they're developing or uh, outside it, but it is a requirement and it's called an affordable housing overlay. Bruce. Thank you. So. So anyway, that's that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So if we could yeah. do that, that would help. Um, I will fill out the, f the survey, and uh, it might be at length, but you know where I live, so. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate your perspective on that. Is there anybody online, I'm trying to alternate between in-person and online, anybody online who would like to take a turn to speak? Not seeing anyone. Um, anybody in person? We um, have a few more minutes. A couple ending comments, but I want to encourage you to come up. Although, I want to make sure if if it's somebody who hasn't spoken yet, to make sure that I mean, I, I want to invite you to speak. I just want to make sure that folks who have not spoken also. Thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, reinforce what the previous gentleman said. I uh, walk my dog on a regular basis through the Kirkwood Mobile Home Park at the end of Kirkwood, West Kirkwood. And uh, that has been bought by uh, an investor. And the all of the tenants in the Kirkwood Village Trailer Court have received notices that they need to get out. And uh, they're perfectly, they'll be first in line for the new apartments that are gonna be built there and there are a number of trailers in the Kirkwood Village, uh, village uh, that it's four units in one trailer. Wow. So those are affordable. They have to be affordable. And I was, I, you know, walking through with my dog and the resident was out. It was a nice day. She said, can I pet your dog? And I said, yeah. And so anyway. So I knew that this purchase had gone on because I'd seen it, and I asked her, you know, and I had noticed that some of the trailers were gone. And so I asked her, you know, what's going on? She told me about this letter. She says, there's absolutely no way that I can afford a market apartment. And she didn't know what she was gonna do. So anyway, it does seem that uh, there seems to be a bias against trailers and you know, eliminating that source of affordable housing. Yeah, I'll just quick clarify because you raise a great point. The reason that mobile home parks can be a source of housing instability is because the traditional model is that even if it's an owner-occupied home, the land is typically owned by a landlord, and so they have lot rent. And so the source of housing instability is that the landlord can choose to redevelop, sell their land at any time. Um, there are models that are similar to a community land trust that in some cases have been implemented where the um, land or the mobile homeowners can buy the land under there. Um, but I just wanted to make that clear because not everybody maybe realizes that why that's a source of housing instability. Right. Thanks for doing this, by the way. These are things that have been on my mind a lot. I mean, I was up until 3 a.m. last night, so. Um, there's another, another mobile home park that's also been sold on the other side of um, 6937 uh, off of Tap Road. 
I don't know if you're aware of that one, but I'd had people, you know, my mother talks to everyone, so it's, the, <laughs> hey, I met so-and-so at Sam's Club and, or Walmart, and they're having this issue. Can you help with that? And then I, you know, I know how to read these different documents, and there are a number of people who are either um, uh, disabled in one way or another, have um, adult disabled children or something, and, and now they're, they have no idea what to do. I don't know how much time they have left, but in that case, the property was purchased and they were told to leave. So I, that was very worrisome, and I had to really search for that location. It's a very small one. Um, a few things I wanted to address by uh, what other people had mentioned. The Airbnb is not always a rental of, um, that's permanent, and it can be listed as just a room. Whenever I was attending some classes at UCLA, I Airbnb'd my house, and when I got back, I didn't have uh, employment at the time, no income, not much. And so I also had my, um, my room, one of my rooms, uh, rented out via Airbnb. So we can't just blanket statement Airbnb on that. Um, my, my interest is in the resilience of the community. I've been active in the urban agriculture sphere since about 2008, nine. Um, I'm familiar with the statistics um, of uh, how many rentals compared to home ownership, which is why I'd started this huge um, document uh, spreadsheet of trying to find that information out. So those of you who are working on this, I'd really like to be in touch with you all. Um, one of the things with the Sudbury development, Sudbury uh, Summit development, is that according to the um, Sustainability Action Plan, is that uh, it was placed in a food desert. I've been trying to get national data for that, but regardless, we still have lost luckies on that side of town, and it makes it very difficult um, for people to get around. There is nothing, and the uh, council, city council did not mention anything. It seemed like they were unaware whenever I called into the meeting and mentioned this, that they wanted to have public uh, safety in elementary school land, but there was no mention of anything for um, food in that. Uh, and that's something that's really spurred me looking forward. Um, whenever I finally graduated, um, after going back to school in 2008-9, our uh, economy collapsed. And so I, like many millennials, although I'm not a millennial, I feel that and I feel that we are in a very precarious situation internationally and nationally with what's going on with inflation. My olive oil has gone from $24 to almost 40 for the same thing. So to say that, you know, that we don't have inflation on top of increased tax rates, which um, threatens those on limited incomes, that's a problem. I see that if you cannot grow your own food with all these rentals, that means that we have less um, av availability to be able to support ourselves. And something that no one ever talks about is limits to growth. Do we, do we look at limits? When we build up, are we going to go back to the way it was looking at it, uh, I think, during the Cruzan administration, where we're looking at neighborhoods, such as when I lived in San Francisco, and building those up? I'm actually in favor of making those buildings taller in those specific areas, like around Templeton, where we have that. Um, but it's because if we keep subdividing, then we're going to take away our ability to create our own food supply should anything happen again, like more COVID. We have China doing more things over there that are, um, you know, testing out. There's a new virus going around. So if our food system collapses or is in precarious situation again, can we rely upon our local growers? And for what food sources? Because that then affects our health. So I'm a health and wellness coach, I'm a grower, I grow functional foods. So how does that affect our health and how, you know, this is a multi-dimensional program, so, or problem. So yes, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. We are at the end of our meeting time. Um, I do hope if we could, we have the survey link up here. Um, I do hope that if you have additional comments you didn't get to share today or if you didn't get a chance to speak today, um, that you will use that survey link to share your comments. Um, we have 
one more public meeting on September 3rd at Tri North Middle School, and then we have five upcoming, we had one yesterday and a total of six, but five upcoming stakeholder workshops, which are specific topic areas. That they're all at noon. Um, if you go to the consolidated um, plan website on the city's website, it has the, the link. If you'd like to join that via Zoom, you're welcome to do that or invite others to as well. Again, there's different topics for each of those dates that's coming up. There's one more tomorrow and then some next week. Um, so again, the next couple of weeks will be busy for feedback. And so we really appreciate your time coming today and thank you for everybody who um, listened and spoke and uh, appreciate your time contributing to your community. Thank you.